My name is Kate Orff. I'm the director of the Columbia University Urban Design Program. And uh, welcome to this next installment of our Urban Design in Practice lecture series. So we have students from Columbia University and from around the world and faculty as well. Um, we're so glad to be able to convene in this online forum to uh, think about, discuss, uh, and hear from some of the most prominent and interesting practitioners of architecture and urban design uh, today. Um, we have a special uh, special event today. We have uh, Professor Emmanuel Admasu with us, uh, who's joining us from Colombia. And uh, I'm just very excited in particular to welcome Emmanuel because he's also joining the full-time faculty of Colombia and we could not be more excited. Uh, he brings just an incredible dynamism um, and kind of a sensibility that brings together um, art, architecture, social justice, and spatial practices um, that is completely compelling. Uh, by May, way of a very brief bio, and Emmanuel, I hope you can expand on this in, in your remarks. He is a founding partner of the dynamic and emerging firm ADWO uh, with his partner, Jen Wood. And when I say emerging, it's sort of silly to say that an emerging firm has had a major exhibit in the Museum of Modern Art. I suppose that moniker no longer applies, Emmanuel. Uh, and congratulations, uh, his uh, adwo was part of this seminal exhibit called Reconstructions, Architecture and Blackness in America at the Museum of Modern Art, uh, curated uh, jointly with, um, with, with our, our very own Mabel, Mabel Wilson here. So um, he is also a practicing architect and urban designer with built projects uh, in Addis Ababa and, and in the US. And today's focus, uh, his lecture is titled Aft After Property. So the focus of his lecture today will likely be very targeted on his urban design and urban research and on kind of a new framing. And so this is my special message to Columbia architecture students, uh, particularly in their first semester. You will have the pleasure of having Emmanuel as your coordinated, coordinating faculty member for your fall semester. So I believe, you know, many of the concepts that he addresses here will likely be explored within the space of the studio. So um, um, again, welcome, Emmanuel. And um, in terms of the structure and flow of, of today's lecture, um, Professor David Smiley, uh, who's here, will be moderating the question and answer period. And a quick thank you to Tal first for her uh, organizational uh, assistance and David Cohen with this lecture series. So um, with that, um, I will turn it over to you, Emmanuel, with a very warm welcome, uh, both for this lecture and to Columbia. I believe this might be your first event. And uh, thanks for joining us for this lecture series. Okay. Um, thank you uh, for having me <laughs> and uh, for the wonderful introduction, Kate. Can you guys see my screen? Okay, and you can hear me fine? Yes. Okay. Um, so, I, what I would, <laughs> I want to start off by saying, you know, um, exactly 10 years ago, I was sitting in Avery Hall as a student. Uh, so this lecture has uh, great symbolic value uh, for me, now returning as an educator in the same institution. Um, so I'll be uh, presenting uh, two projects. Um, as provocations or strategies to uh, operate against the regime of property. Um, and these are, you know, of course, very large questions that require collective imagination across various disciplines and cultural geographies. Um, and I believe that 2020 should not be understood as an anomaly, but a, but a turning point uh, to reframe our relationship with each other and also our relationship to the planet. So in fall 2020, I taught a studio at the PSD called After Pop. Uh, the premise of the studio was very direct. Uh, how can we disentangle architecture from property? 
And how can we use this moment of global lockdown and uprising to disassemble uh, the exploitative regimes of speculation and displacement that anchor the built environment? The studio uh, challenged participants to identify temporal slippages and spatial practices that carve out uh, moments of liberation from the limits of poverty. And studio participants developed a kind of collective intelligence that experimented with ways of seeing beyond the privatized enclosure, uh, building a world that was not tethered to ownership. This work was, of course, done by uh, recognizing, drawing, and modeling ordinary spatial practices that operate against the hegemony of real estate speculation, systems that value people over property, in order to develop a dynamic archive of spatial, temporal, uh, basically constructs and samples. Through reinterpretations of historical and contemporary uh, interventions where everyday struggles that begin to approach the surreal or even the sublime. The aim was to liberate urban design and architecture from their inherent commitments as uh, supporterizers. We modeled uh, undervalued spatial practices that actively uh, dismantled the Cartesian frame of racial capitalism as a gathering of performances uh, committed to imagining a different world uh, because the status quo is untenable. In spring 2021, I taught a version of the studio at RISD. Uh, and this fall, uh, for those of you going into UV2, I look forward to continuing these uh, experiments uh, in a much larger kind of urban context. In 2020, we were also uh, completing work for the exhibition um, Reconstructions, Architecture, and Blackness in America. And our installation was called Immeasurability. Manuel, sorry to interrupt. Can you just check you're not covering your my mic? Yeah, no, oh. I think it's better. Thank Can you. you hear me better now? Yes. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, so this is us kind of installing uh, the exhibition for reconstructions. And, you know, basically, I think. <laughs> Uh, part of the challenge here is that um, these interventions, both academic and uh, my practice, are really attempts to deal with the, with the ethical dimensions of urban design and architecture, uh, both in the discursive realm and in the spatial realm. Um, and I will say that this lecture will not provide any solutions uh, for, for these questions, but basically it would provide a series of fragmentary uh, provocations that hopefully will expand our collective imagination. And this, this friction between, um, you know, the, our politics and our discipline is also a very much evident in my practice, ADWO, uh, in collaboration with Jen Wood. And uh, the project on the right is uh, slated to start construction later this year. So we do a series of commission projects uh, for clients. And most of these projects have been multifamily residential projects. And most of them have been designed uh, for the city where I was born and raised, which is Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. Um, but if one half uh, of our practice is interested in urban design and architecture, the other half uh, is more broadly engaged in art production. Um, it has been extremely generative for us to maintain uh, the projective potential of a design practice, along with the explicit cultural and political critique of an art practice, simultaneously building and unbuilding. We have been thinking a lot about this image. Uh, this is an etching of Savannah, Georgia by Peter Gordon, establishing the colony of Georgia in America. It is, in a way, an explicit diagram for the spatial practices of settler colonialism. It simultaneously illustrates uh, the erasure of uh, indigenous communities and cosmologies, but also transforms uh, this communal land into individuated uh, private property. 
But we also all know that uh, histories, and in most cases, empires are constructed through specific tools of visual representation. Who gets to represent whom and under what circumstances? What value system is being communicated and visualized through that image? We have been examining uh, the colonial obsession with uh, measurability, uh, a specific worldview that understands land as something that can be measured, owned, uh, and exploited. These images also work to make human and more than human life quantifiable. And this is how the continent of Africa was partitioned at the infamous uh, Berlin Conference in 1884, facilitating the extraction of resources and labor from the continent to Europe. Uh, and the Americas. The map on the right measures the density of enslaved people in each county in the state of Georgia in 1861, measuring both uh, land and people as property. Another example of this proclivity uh, across the Atlantic Ocean is the nine by nine meter grid of the coconut shamba uh, or farm established by uh, Sultan Majid uh, bin Said of Zanzibar in 1862 that initiated a regime of measurability on Dar es Salaam. The land, uh, its people and resources have since been allotted um, to quantifiable units. Under the German colonial uh, regime, the coconut shamba uh, transmuted into plots for segregated single family homes, again, grafting speculation on communal land. And more recently, the asymmetrical allocation of capital and land rights has transformed uh, these plots into uh, mid-rise residential condominiums. But maybe what is more interesting to us uh, are the forms of resistance and transmutation that work against these colonial interventions. Uh, for example, the colonial fragmentation uh, of Dar es Salaam is registered at the scale of city block in Karyako, as you can see here, composed of multiple plots that are of course individually owned. And it demonstrates how those single family homes have been incrementally converted into these uh, residential condominiums. These towers are currently being repurposed into storage facilities for the shops on the ground floor. And like most other cities, storage spaces are used as uh, placeholders for future uh, real estate speculation. But the interstitial spaces resulting from the unitization of Kari Co by the coconut grid and the Swahili plot are now being reinscribed uh, by the former president, uh, John uh, Magafuli's decision to basically legitimize street trading. And this has completely uh, transformed uh, the pedestrian experience in the city and more specifically in Kari Co. Two Markets is uh, a drawing project uh, exhibiting 16 large format drawings, uh, along with images commissioned uh, from uh, photographers in both cities. And I would say that, you know, in lieu of uh, the aerial photographs um, that are typically employed to represent African cities as homogenous corrugated roofscapes, uh, the drawings identify specific moments of political intensification. Um, moments where uh, a political project materializes into urban form. And this preoccupation with marketplaces in Africa uh, comes from an acknowledgement uh, of their role as testing sites uh, for the future of these cities and nation states. They offer dynamic models uh, to trace the ongoing cultural, political, and economic shifts uh, in these nation states and also the continent at large. Kariko and Mercato are not only sites of local trade, uh, but they're also sites where global economic and political regimes are being negotiated. From the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative uh, to the ever-present resonances of the colonial project. They are made up of spatial practices that unfold at the scale of the body, the city, and the planet. These everyday spaces can also be understood as sites of collective agency uh, from radically different forms of sharing space to spatial tactics that work against surveillance and precarity. One of the earliest experiments in representation uh, came in the form of a stop motion animation 
uh, we produced in collaboration with Ezra Wube. And this seven minute stop motion animation basically compresses 80 years of uh, spatial uh, history in Mercator. As uh, Ezra uh, translated our drawings and diagrams of the market into these immersive worlds, made up of found images and his own sketches, photographs, and uh, sound recordings. This was followed by a large uh, 2.7 by 4.2 meter tapestry uh, for the Amer African Mobilities Exhibition in Munich, curated by Mpo Matsipa. And this tapestry uh, reassembles the market into an array of 126 uh, scenes as a response to how Mercato's merchants devised uh, material temporality as a strategy to anchor uh, themselves to the marketplace. Studying and learning from Charles Gaines's uh, numbers and trees on the right, these market scenes were transcribed into elevations and codified into woven notations by their degree of material permanence. But part of the challenge for us uh, is the inherent bias imbe embedded in architectural representation. Um, it was invented to do the work of appropriation and privatization. Um, but two markets aims to uh, implement a framework of animus materialism, working against a Darwinian evolution towards uh, Western modernity. The drawings aim to be in conversation with works being produced by contemporary artists like Autobahn and Kanga, uh, Ida Mulina, as, uh, Elias Simme, just to name a few. And these works really provide uh, pertinent references for reconsidering how uh, we could represent the material and immaterial uh, aspects of the city. Uh, animism is a refusal to establish any separation between our bodies and our planet as a recognition of uh, shared agency. For several centuries, Tanzania has been experiencing extended colonial invasion from Portugal, Oman, Germany, and England, while Ethiopia has remained relatively cloistered until a brief, a brief Italian occupation uh, from 1936 to 1941. We chose um, to research these two cities in relative proximity and Sub-Saharan Africa to articulate difference uh, within a context that is typically flattened and homogenized. The name of the Kariko uh, neighborhood is a Swahiliized derivation of Care Corps Depot, a building that was used by German and British troops uh, during the First World War uh, that you can see on the far right of this photograph. Inversely, the Karika Market Hall of today, uh, which is the anchor of the neighborhood in Dar es Salaam, is an open air structure shaded by 24 concrete funnels, each spanning 15 meters, that harvest rain and facilitate passive cooling for the trading spaces below. The Market Hall is an animist enactment of the Arusha Declaration, which introduced President Julius Nerere's political philosophy of Ujama, or familyhood. Uh, promoting egalitarianism, socialism, and self-reliance. Designed by Tanganyikan architect Beta Amuli, the market hall canopy re recalls uh, the coconut trees under which markets were held in the past. In Mercato, a building designed as the first multi-story mall uh, during the final stages of Emperor, Emperor Haile Selassie's uh, feudalist regime ended up being built uh, as a distribution center by the succeeding socialist military junta, the Derg. Again, demonstrating the instability of monuments and architectural symbols. The relative proximity to water uh, plays a big role in determining the texture and ambiance of the two marketplaces. Mercato being positioned at the center of a landlocked country versus Carico uh, being 15 minutes uh, from, uh, or let's say a 15 minute walk from the Indian Ocean. But Dar es Salaam's proximity uh, to the Indian Ocean has rendered it valuable and therefore vulnerable. Multiple types of boats, ships, and tankers are employed 
in a choreographed process of extraction, uh, taking resources and labor from the hinterlands of East Africa across the ocean. In Addis, uh, it's not water, but topography that has significantly determined uh, the urban form of the city. Settled as a temporary, farm, uh, temporary military camp uh, for the Ethiopian empire, a nodal network of houses for army generals and tenants radiate out from the rural compound on adjacent hilltops. In a way, militarizing the topography to defend the territory from colonial invasion. And these rivers and residential compounds on hilltops continue to anchor uh, the main neighborhoods of the city. Uh, to the west of the largest hill is uh, where the original market was located. Similarly, um, echoes of this perimeter logic uh, and uh, temporary occupation can be found in present day Mercato, where the construction sites are fortified at their base uh, with rings of merchant stalls. These stalls are uh, abbreviations of what, um, you know, the, the future market will be, uh, but they're also in a way um, echoes of uh, the previous market. And they allow merchants to uh, maintain relationships with their customers during the three to five year construction period required to uh, build the new malls. I would argue that our work grapples with the overlaps between identity and geography, uh, both as non-static and highly contested realms of investigation. It has been uh, productive to think of these marketplaces as sites uh, where people are engaged in practices of liberation that are working against various forms of enclosure and containment. It is safe to say that uh, the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative is one of the most important um, and influential factors really shaping the future of these uh, cities. The median age uh, of the Ethiopian and Tanzanian population is approximately 18 years of age. Today, 45% of Ethiopia's population is under 15 and 71% is under 30. So these heavily subsidized uh, large-scale infrastructural investments by foreign nations are hoping to gain access to these future customers and laborers. On the right here is the light rail system that recently got completed in Addis. Similarly, uh, the, recent, the recently built BRT or uh, bus rapid transit system in Dar es Salaam is serviced by Chinese Golden Dragon buses, radiating tentacles uh, of Carico to the periphery. In Mercato, uh, green and yellow fence is interrupted by signage for the CGCOC group, a Belt and Road initiative contractor and one of the largest contractors in the world, whose revenue is primarily derived from building roads throughout the continent of Africa. So this pale concrete frame foreshadows a future bus terminal within a network of transportation infrastructure that is almost exclusively constructed by the Chinese government. The overwhelming forces of global capital are also apparent uh, on Misambazi Street. Uh, wallpapered in ITEL red and Technomobile blue, demarcating the western border of the Kariko neighborhood and physicalizing uh, the mobile banking networks of Dar es Salaam. It materializes the battle uh, for control of next generation 5G networks between Chinese, Indian, and British multinational corporations. Only 2% of Tanzanians rely on conventional banks, leading to a massive popularity of uh, these M-Pesa apps. So uh, M refers to mobile and Pesa means money in Swahili. And these M-Pesa apps are now being used by about 65% of urban Tanzanians, allowing them to store, uh, transfer, send, and receive money uh, via their cell phones. We're also interested in uh, local forms of refusal that work against this uh, global regime. 
uh, when a Malaysian developer was negotiating with the Ethiopian government uh, to buy out the marketplace uh, with hopes of building a central business district, the merchants started forming cooperatives and started developing the market through uh, different forms of collective ownership. Now, uh, single malls occupy almost every block within the marketplace, owned and maintained by up to 40 merchants and their uh, families consolidating individual stalls into these uh, stacked mega blocks. But in addition to these ownership models, the rhythm of these marketplaces is also determined by rituals uh, and ordinary practices associated with spaces of worship. Two large blocks at the northeast of Mercato uh, de deviate from the orthogonal grid of the Italian master plan. The of uh, the Anwar Mosque and the Silver Dome of St. Rodwell Church. Their deliberate co-location by the Italian regime was intended to incite animosity. However, uh, these two religious institutions have managed to peacefully share uh, these walls um, with each other for the past 80 years. Hopefully um, the most uh, important and maybe long lasting legacy of the show uh, that was on view at the Museum of Modern Art this uh, past spring is the formation of the Black Reconstruction Collective. Uh, the 10 of us who were um, commissioned for the show decided to form a nonprofit in order to continue the work of reconstruction uh, or um, the incomplete project of emancipation well after the passing event of the exhibition. The aim is to provide funding and intellectual support for liberatory practices within art and design. And this is our manifesting statement uh, covering the name of the gallery. Adwo's contribution to the exhibition is called Immeasurability uh, and our installation was really born out of a fundamental question. If architecture is a discipline that encloses space, making it measurable and exploitable, then how can we think of an architecture without measure, an architecture that refuses enclosure and borderization? Our installation is primarily made up of two disks, uh, a vertical disk and a horizontal disk. Uh, and it was important for us to really think of uh, blackness at the planetary scale. Therefore, one disk, the one you're uh, looking at right now, um, operates at the scale of the city and the other disc operates the scale of the planet, uh, depicting the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, uh, which is a planetary scar, uh, a massive shift uh, and rift on the ocean floor of the Atlantic. But it's also a site for an incalculable loss uh, of uh, Black life during the Middle Passage, as enslaved Africans were moving across this line uh, to the Americas. And this is the detail of uh, the tapestry that we uh, produced uh, for the exhibition. For me, as someone who grew up on the continent of Africa, uh, it was also important to consider the process of racialization that one experiences upon crossing the Atlantic. That line has always been uh, the space for the formation of blackness. The moment you cross that line to the West, you basically become black. To the East, you are Yoruba, Amhara, uh, etc. And I would say that mostly uh, this happens because the construction of race relies uh, on uh, the homogenization of blackness, but also the formation of value in relation to whiteness. So um, the Mid Atlantic Ridge really establishes this echo and link uh, with the continent of Africa. Eli Whitney painted the cotton gin in Savannah, Georgia. The city of Atlanta was established as a terminus for federally funded train lines uh, that were linking the port of Savannah to the hinterlands and by extension to enslaved people in West Africa. Therefore, uh, the movement of goods and enslaved labor across the Atlantic and uh, from the port is what generated the city of Atlanta. Uh, and Atlanta has always been really the space of movement, much like uh, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. So we kept meditating on uh, 
the Mid-Atlantic Ridge and really gathering a set of maps that were generated for slave traders who were attempting to navigate the winds of the Atlantic. Especially these maps uh, of wind patterns on the coast um, of West Africa uh, depicted by Matthew Fontaine Maury, uh, who was nicknamed Pathfinder of the Seas. Again, uh, measuring not only land, but also wind patterns to facilitate the larger project of extraction. Maury eventually resigned his commission as uh, a US Navy commander and joined the Confederacy during the Civil War. So you can see that even these seemingly abstract uh, notations uh, are tied to certain ideas of racialization. Our work on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge has also been um, deeply influenced by a long list of contemporary artists who have been thinking um, about the Atlantic Ocean, both as site and subject. Uh, for example, Mati Diop's recent film, Atlantics. Uh, in addition to that, we were also interested in um, the refusal of legibility by contemporary artists like Chris Ophelia especially his Blue Devil series. Uh, as you can sense from these photographs, it's almost impossible to read these paintings head on. Oph Ophelia uses silver paint mixed with dark blues so that light catches uh, the different forms within the painting in, in unexpected ways. So we wanted the tapestry uh, to not only depict uh, the history uh, of um, the diaspora, but to think about contemporary forms of surveillance and policing that limit the mobility of Black people. So uh, we started working with and transforming these uh, cartographic and oceanographic uh, notations. It was also important for us to, to maintain an explicit material relationship between the urban and the planetary. Uh, more specifically, uh, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge and the city of Atlanta. Uh, as we did more research, we uncovered that uh, a magnetic black sand called magnetite is present along the length of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. Uh, so we started doing a series of experiments testing magnetite as a material to uh, potentially represent the immeasurability of black spatial practices in Atlanta and uh, the Atlantic. So the city of Atlanta uh, is a horizontal environment uh, that is primarily defined by its highway infrastructure, its single family homes and strip malls. And these spaces appear as clearings uh, within the forest. And these, these relatively generic everyday environments gain meaning based on who occupies them uh, and the types of ephemeral events they facilitate. So it's not um, a city built on exceptional and monumental piece of architecture, but really ordinary spaces that uh, facilitate extraordinary events. We've also been thinking about, you know, um, really banal kind of uh, everyday spaces like the bedrooms and closets where young musicians are producing uh, some of the most important albums in popular culture. Uh, the strip malls and fast food restaurants uh, that provide spaces for different forms of communality. Simultaneously, um, we were very much interested in the history of these uh, ephemeral spatial practices. And we started looking at Freaknik as a form of cultural production uh, that has direct spatial implications. Uh, Freaknik, uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, was a yearly event where students from historically black colleges and universities flew to Atlanta uh, from all over the country for a picnic uh, during uh, their spring break. And each year it became more and more popular uh, until its peak in the mid nineties. And what's, what's really fascinating is that the influx of college students uh, would create a lot of traffic jams uh, throughout the city. And those traffic jams ended up becoming dance parties. So uh, it became this way of reinterpreting the highway from a space that typically cuts black people off from the city or the suburb into a space for an extended outdoor party. 
And I would say these are the types of immeasurable spatial practice, practices that are uh, extremely inspiring uh, for our practice. So we started doing a series of these experiments uh, with the glass department at RISD, uh, trying to test various ways of slowly transforming black sand into black glass. And these are a few studies uh, from those experiments. And, you know, in other words, the immeasurability of uh, Black spatial practices is always, in a way, um, tied to both containment and liberation. Uh, so uh, the horizontal disk uh, and the installation is made up of these 160 bricks covered in black sand and magnetite, modeling these everyday uh, spaces of black life. We are also interested in blurring um, uh, between, you know, uh, the lush and seemingly endless uh, forests surrounding Atlanta and the signs that you would see uh, in the landscape from the highway, et cetera, associating these generic um, spaces uh, with specific groups of people. Um, when I lived in Atlanta for 10 years, Waffle House was our destination after the nightclub. It's basically the place you go to at 4 a.m. Uh, for your last meal before bed. Uh, so we produced a series of these collages of Waffle House. These um, subtle and somewhat surreal uh, interpretations of the woods in Atlanta keep appearing in popular culture. Uh, for example, most recently in Donald uh, Glover's TV show, Atlanta, uh, the woods episode where Paperboy gets lost uh, in, in the woods, um, or Young Thug's uh, video for Chanel, and even further back to Outcast's video for uh, Elevators. So we're interested in spaces that are both mythical and ordinary. And we worked with uh, Bednark uh, in Brooklyn to fabricate the cone. Uh, and the cone is topped with black glass and the magnetite is basically shifting on top of that black glass. Um, and on the glass were uh, these 160 unique cleats that uh, allow the bricks to lock in. And below uh, the glass are two shelves. The top shelf has these um, magnetic robots that are shifting back and forth uh, and uh, also moving the sand. And below that is another shelf housing uh, the speakers projecting the soundscape of Atlanta. And the soundscape was really based on a day in the life uh, of a person in Atlanta. Uh, so basically one minute for um, every hour of the day. And the, the soundscape lines up with the fragments of the city on the disc. And this is us uh, frantically assembling uh, the horizontal disc right before the opening of the show. And you can see the cleats and the templates that were used uh, to put the bricks down. So that's, that's it for the slide presentation, but I'll quickly show um, a video of um, the sand being activated. It's very subtle, but hopefully you can see it. But thank you, that's it.
Thank you so much, Manuel. That was um, offered us many things to think about. I'm writing down notes frantically. Um, everyone, um, please uh, put uh, questions in the chat. <clears throat> Are you able to hear me okay? I realized yeah. my notes were covering this, uh, mic, so. <laughs> okay, the lessons of Zoom. Um, <clears throat> uh, I, I'm really taken with um, the kind of uh, detail and the breadth uh, of your work. I, I just want <clears throat> to, I'll come and, and ask my own questions, but I do want to ask everyone to uh, please um, pop some questions uh, into the chat. Oh, I've got one. And so um, it's really important, uh, as you know, students and friends, to uh, make inquiries, <clears throat> even challenge nicely, of course. So anyway, um, I'm, I'm really um, taken with the, uh, the kind of uh, opposition that you against terms like the enlightenment or the colonial project, you know, versus your idea of animism, that uh, animism is somehow unregulated. And um, uh, just, that's a great framework for positing another form of social life that isn't codified and, and uh, grid bound, if, if I can use that term like Savannah <clears throat> and um, but I don't know anything about animism. I mean, I took anthropology 101, but uh, I think that was in the pre enlightenment days. Um, so I'm wondering um, if you could kind of comment on that binary or that opposition, how it's fruitful for you and how it's fruitful for a kind of um, setting up an alternative practice. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, a, <laughs> that's a great question, but I almost feel like that question alone could be a full lecture. Um, so I'll try to give a fragment uh, of, of the way we've been thinking about it. I mean, uh, more specifically, our definition, or at least our interest in animism comes from the work of um, the theorist Harry Garuba, the late Harry Garuba, who just passed away recently. And I think the most fundamental critique that he provides uh, for the colonial project is the linear conception of time. So a lot of his ideas around animism are really based on nonlinear understandings of time that force us to collapse histories together in order to begin operating on them. Um, so I would say that that is probably the first step. The second is, you know, the tendency uh, <laughs> you know, but we're within Western epistemology to create separation between the human and nature. Um, so in a sense, a lot of the, the writing on animist materialism embeds the, the human within nature. And there's always this understanding of shared agency uh, that the planet has, that <laughs> other living beings have just as much as us. And, and I think those two approaches alone give us a lot of tools to begin operating on and carving away uh, the, the kind of, you know, the monumentality of, of uh, the, the disciplines and knowledge systems that we've all been uh, trained in. Um, but I think that that is, that is the oscillation as you've identified. One is almost oppositional, which has been really generative, like by basically, for example, with the studios, from the beginning by positioning ourselves against real estate speculation have forced us to imagine a different type of city, right? So I think um, similarly, if we're saying we're anti-colonial from the beginning, then that creates a completely different way of engaging with one another, but also engaging with, um, you know, our ideas of progress <laughs> or, or uh, modernity. Um, so, yeah. That is, <clears throat> that is indeed a full lecture required, but you'll be around, we'll do that. Um, one, one person asks, um, 
what is the difference or what is the impact uh, or what is the kind of status of being both an artist and an architect? How does that affect your commissioned work? Um, is there any overlap? Are there re different relationships when you have actually, when you have developers? I mean, it, sound, it feels like there could be a tension in there. Can't hear you. Sorry, I don't know if I did that um, to the recording, but you're good. I was trying to unmute myself. Um, I feel like okay. <laughs> To be quite honest, this is precisely the question that we're dealing with uh, on an everyday basis within our practice. You know, um, we we love designing buildings. Uh, we love uh, engaging with kind of the projective uh, potential of architecture and urban design. But we keep getting frustrated by the simple fact that we're making these beautiful things that eventually lead to uh, certain forms of dispossession and displacement. So for us, the art practice became, in a way, uh, a hack <laughs> to, to maybe destabilize um, the, the design practice, you know? And I think um, there are limits both ways. You know, there are obviously major, major limits to any type of critique presented through an art practice. And you can say similar things about a design practice. So for us, the, these two avenues force us to, to engage with ideas uh, more broadly, but also when we see the limits of one type of practice, we can change gears and say, actually, this is, this is no longer architecture, this is art. And um, it's been really intellectually enriching and it's also been liberating to be somewhat undisciplined. Um, and to say there are a set of questions we're interested in investigating and grappling with. And it doesn't matter if they produce, end up producing buildings or if they end up producing uh, tapestries. Um, we want to continue doing both. Um, thank you. Uh, really, that's a, another key uh, distinction or, or opposition that um, it's kind of a good problem to have. But at the same time, it's a problem. <laughs> Another student is asking um, about the two markets that you presented and the representation of those markets. Uh, colors, projections. Um, and she says, I wonder what you expect other viewers to get from seeing urban elements through this lens. Um, well, I, I will say, you know, we have, um, we have been primarily a drawing practice. So a lot of the work has been uh, about engaging with the history of image production and what, what those images entail and, and how they can hopefully be uh, demonstrations of a certain political agenda. And for us, when we started engaging with animist materialism, it became very important to um, at least, let's say, decenter at the building and really engage with other more ephemeral interventions uh, in the city. So I think the first challenge for those, for those images was to equalize uh, at least, you know, uh, the relationship between merchandise and building. Um, and then in addition to that, it was also about, you know, this nonlinear depiction of a particular narrative. So each one of those panels have a, have a story that goes along uh, with it. And those stories are, <laughs> are in some ways cyclical and, and in some ways kind of fold back on themselves. So I would say this is our first attempt at it. And looking at them now, um, I have certain critiques. <laughs> that we would definitely change uh, moving forward. But it was our first attempt to really grapple with um, the limits of architectural representation, how we can engage with uh, certain ideas that are um, being presented by a contemporary artists and how we can bring those ideas into the spatial realm. 
Um, so I hope people can at least think twice about um, the value of these marketplaces while looking at these images. Um, and you know, there's there's so much weight uh, in in the kind of uh, the gaze uh, of the photograph, and we we wanted to slightly move it away from that. Um, so yeah. Um, one thing I noticed about some of those market drawings is that there's a kind of a clear distinction between the architecture and the social life around it. The architecture seems somewhat monumental, but mm. definitely solid and and um, orthogonal. <laughs> and then you have these amazing kind of plans of uh, buses and people and all sorts of things, and they're completely, I would, I wouldn't, they're they're kind of. Um, Clearly Im implicating movement and uh, you know kind of interaction, yeah. and it's a really strong. Uh, it comes across really strongly, and um, and so I just I, it's funny. To, I think that, that we're all, we're all taken with the drawings and trying to read into them a little bit, but I do think that um, the the kind of incredible complexity of the actions, if you will, that you're portraying in those representations is is very strong um and really yeah. i think brings out the the idea of the non-linear and the uh the kind of what some might see as chaotic mm -hmm. is in fact a normal way of life and someone else also ask about these drawings um what is the I mean, this is pushing a little bit further on this idea of communications through the drawings, the representations. Um, how does this strong um, visual and and color coded and um, really um, kind of stunning use of uh, visual tools? Um, do you have an, a particular audience or do you, do you, I mean, what kind of, um, and I'm kind of taking off from the students, the person's comment, um, how does that add to the, the storytelling you're trying to do? How in particular does that method of your representation uh, move things along, share information? How, how do you see, I think I'm dragging out the question further than it needs to be, go ahead. Yeah, I'll say two things. I mean, you know, there, there's a whole other version of this presentation that's really about uh, the collaborations that produced the Two Markets project. Uh, and in both cases, we, are, we have been working with, uh, with um, architects and artists in Dar es Salaam and Addis. Uh, so it's been, I would say, almost eight years of going back and forth, exchanging images and notes and really trying to produce uh, these images that hopefully will challenge people who are intervening uh, on those cities, but also become archives of you know, particular uh, forms of resistance uh, that, that we've identified uh, in the marketplace. So it is for Karyako and is, it is for Mercato. Um, and, and I think it was very important for us to work with photographers in those two cities and to work with artists and architects in those two cities and to make sure that we're producing knowledge that is valuable for them. Um, but having said that, I mean, of course, we are based here <laughs> in the West. So uh, an undercurrent of the work is always challenging uh, the ways in which African cities are uh, represented in Western uh, urban discourse. Um, and I would say not even Af just African cities, but really cities in the global South. You know, there's the tendency to pursue two particular avenues. One is the binary of formal versus informal. And the other is kind of looking for mid-century interventions, uh, which are usually monumental modernist projects. And we want to really look at these spaces as contemporary environments that are, that are changing uh, rapidly. I mean, the population of Ethiopia has pretty much doubled in my lifetime. So when you're dealing with that kind of context, you have to uh, begin to think about density differently. And, and that has a very different value system 
than going over there to sanitize the environment or, or you know, present some sort of quote unquote solution. Um, so, I mean, I don't know. It, a lot of the work is also us working on ourselves. You know, it's ch challenging our own value systems to a certain extent and, and our own training. Um, and I hope at least these conversations will, um, you know, challenge students to, to, to do similar things. Uh, um, another question that's come in um, on a different, well, not that different actually, oh, the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, can you kind of give us a little bit of an expanded view on the impact on the, the um, just how foreign funding for infrastructure is just, um, it seems like an, like an incredible project, both in, you know, the classic terms of colonial uh, infrastructures, but also, but it's hard to envision it today, especially with the population demographics that you also mentioned. So tell us more about your take on Belt and Road. Oh man. Um, I think it's really complicated, you know, and, and I would say, at least speaking specifically from an Ethiopian standpoint, Ethiopia's relationship to China is really complicated. And the simple fact that uh, China provides a clear model, you know, a model that feels accessible. Uh, there's always this narrative, uh, uh, at least uh, promoted within the African context that uh, China was able to radically transform itself within 50 years. So I think for African politicians, that is a very convincing narrative, you know. But when it comes to actual structural changes, you know, addressing uh, lack of access to education, uh, addressing um, or at least building infrastructure that can be maintained by uh, Ethiopians uh, instead of Chinese contractors, those things are not happening. So now uh, a lot of it is leading to an extended relationship that is highly dependent. <laughs> um, for example, the light rail system in Addis is to a certain extent falling apart, mostly because there, were, uh, there weren't that many people trained in Ethiopia to maintain them. So the, the Ethiopian government constantly has to uh, you know, bring contractors and engineers from China to, to maintain uh, the light rail system. So I think maybe 10 years down the line, we'll get a clearer picture, but, but a lot of it, you know, yeah, a lot of it makes me hesitate, let's say. Um, but it does also provide a certain alternative away from Europe and North America. And, and I think that part of it is, is, is uh, probably good. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, I think it's something we're all thinking about. Yeah, it does seem also a repeat of the European project. And yet, obviously not the same, but um, it is quite shocking that how, as you say, there's so much Chinese presence in the infrastructure business. It's, it's, it's amazing. Um, okay, this is a question about um, how, when you present this, this kind of work, uh, how do you um, kind of portray different layers such as scale, society, history, movements? Um, how, how does that find its way into the layers of representation? And um, quote unquote, do you have to put one layer in priority to tell a counter narrative question mark? Yeah, I mean, I think this to a certain extent comes back to your initial question, David, where um, I think the counter narrative is, is always there, you know, 
We know how these cities have been historically represented. So we're working against those models. Um, but when it comes to uh, priorities, I would say, you know, it's a form of storytelling. And, and I think there are specific stories that we think are important to consider when, when thinking about the future of these uh, places. And that determines, you know, uh, the ways in which uh, we compose the images. Um, but yeah, there, there isn't a formula, I would say. <laughs> Um, uh, Dilip Takuna is asking um, that the, uh, the the continental rift uh, in the Atlantic um, has become uh, an important was and and continues to be a, a an oppressive difference between the Americas and Africa. Um, what about he asks Europe and Africa or India and Africa? They too have perpetuated oppressive differences in no less measure. Uh, do you have thoughts on representing continental relations? And yeah, I'll, that's a dilip. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's an excellent question. I would say, you know, that's definitely the next project. Uh, uh, just because of the simple fact that I am from East Africa, I'm, I'm fascinated with the Indian Ocean. Um, and we have started doing some work uh, in that realm, but, but I think it's an incredibly rich and complicated history, um, especially when you begin to understand the relationship that East Africa has had with, you know, uh, Southwest slash South Asia. Um, and I think uh, we do need to think about those relationships because those relationships are becoming extremely important again. Um, but yeah, I think Bill, if you're outlining the, the next project. <laughs> Excellent. Um, and also, I, I, um, I was fascinated how the, the, the rift in the Atlantic was a marker. You know, in the east side, you were from one particular group and on the west side, you became black. Uh, that's a really powerful framing that um, kind of takes the middle passage into a kind of sociological definition or sociological construct that is, uh, again, another powerful image of, of um, understanding blackness as not just blackness, but in fact, as full of threads and stories and differences, uh, which I really appreciate. Um, there's another theme that works related to that, which is um, uh, especially as you, you mentioned it both in Atlanta, but also um, in the African context, which is uh, what you call um, immeasurable spatial practices. And that's hard to imagine in an American city. On the other hand, it's completely, the American cities are full of such, you know, um, appropriations for, for different groups. And um, I wonder how that's, where that's going in, in your work, or perhaps you need to uh, give a little peek at your fall, your fall thoughts, your fall semester thoughts. Um, because again, that's a very, you know, that's kind of anti-disciplinary. You know, we don't do immeasurable. You know, that's just like, you know, that is a challenge to so many, so much of our language, so much of our assumptions, so much of our, of our methods. And yet so many urban design groups, small firms, big firms, well, mostly the smaller firms, experimental firms uh, in South America, as well as other places, some in the US are really looking to um, bring these so-called immeasurable spatial and social practices into a larger challenge to urban design practices from the kind of planning and disciplinary tr tradition of, of um, rules and conventions. So um, could you kind of give us a, a, an idea about how you see that working in your Atlanta work a little bit further? Yeah, I mean, uh, I would say that really comes from 
a certain intuition that I feel, uh, at least within our practice, we've been discussing with urban design and architecture team seems to measure in order to take. Uh, and the first question was maybe, can we measure in order to share? Um, and that became increasingly <laughs> difficult to imagine. So then we said, what if we give up on the whole uh, idea of, of measuring um, and really actually try to understand uh, a more non-static uh, uh, way of understanding these spaces. Um, so, I mean, full disclosure, I think it's a way in which we, we are trying to um, compromise maybe some of the, uh, the over-determination of form uh, when it comes to urban design and architecture. So we're, we're trying to, we're wondering if there are other conversations that we can begin to engage with as designers uh, that could help us reimagine cities. Um, and in the Atlanta context, it was really honestly uh, <laughs> taking the, the brief very uh, literally. You know, the, it's, the show is called Reconstructions, Architecture and Blackness in America. We decided from the beginning because of the simple fact that I moved from Addis to Atlanta, we decided to investigate Atlanta. And we started looking at zip codes in Atlanta that uh, are majority black. And, you know, it became very clear very quickly that these spaces are made up of uh, strip malls, fast food restaurants, um, and, and these kind of single family homes. So we started really drawing those spaces. And the more we drew them, the more we understood that they would never be considered quote unquote architecture with a capital A. So they always fall outside of the value system of architecture and urban design. And um, that's really what led to, to that consideration. But I think immeasurability is a super generative concept that we'll keep coming back to. And I have a feeling six months down the line, I might have a, a better answer. Uh, for, for this question, but it's it's kind of again uh, not not relying on property lines, not relying on form, but really other ways of relating to one another, um, and that that's what led to that um, concept. Uh, <clears throat> just a teeny little footnote, because um, I'm thinking about this right now. In Broadacre City by Frank Lloyd Wright, uh, it's a gridded plan, just like from Jefferson to whomever. I mean, it, it's that tradition of American gridding. And yet um, he proposes that the there's no private land ownership, that it's more of a cooperative. So um, I don't really quite buy it from him because I don't really, on the other hand, he did, you know, he he has he he spoke to many uh, economists and social theorists and created an interesting position. But I think more to the point is that um, when you bring up this idea that you you don't want to at first you went you wanted to measure in order to share, which was a, a first step away from measuring in order to take. But then you say the measurement is it's itself the problem. So. Um, I guess you would say measuring to share would be reformist and measuring not at all would be a kind of radical, a radical challenge to that. And I, I think that's a great, for me, that's a great way to think about um, how measurement can be both um, involved in some way, but also needs to be kind of challenged at the larger scale. Okay, one, one more question, perhaps um, a bit of a challenge, uh, one student, is really interested in the 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 rift, the Atlantic Rift, and um, and asks, um, how do you make that rift question? How do you take it to other audiences? And the second part of the question is um, that the student is. Um, would I think wants a little bit fuller explanation of that 
the role of the rift in creating this uh, two categories. And uh, one more piece. Um, yeah, so just take that. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, um, I think I got lost halfway through. So the- Oh, yeah, me too. Sorry. <laughs> Essentially, the um, I think the student is saying that uh, maybe the rift is too easy. Mm. Maybe the rift is, um, I mean, I would say that it's a kind of heuristic as well as, as a kind of content device, but um, I think the student is just asking for clarification about that. And from that, um, how, do, how does the representation of that be, you know, show the complexity, not just the simplicity of, of a rift? Yeah, I mean, look, <laughs> we're, we're trying to address global blackness and in and, and one tapestry. It's already a ridiculous proposition, right? So I think this is this is the issue with the representation. You kind of have to choose um, one way of talking about a particular issue that hopefully will open up millions of other perspectives. And for us, the more we kept thinking about uh, racialization caused through you know a particular form of forced migration the more uh, we, we struggled to represent it. And, and then we said, okay, let's just look at the Atlantic Ocean, the actual space. It's kind of similar to what I was saying with Atlanta, right? And when we zoomed in, we, we found this painting. Actually, I believe um, a lot of the research on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge was done at Columbia. Um, and once we found that, we were just like, man, this is really the space for the formation of blackness and the kind of invention uh, of, of race. And, and we, we started basically kind of meditating on that, looking at other artists who are, who are thinking about the Atlantic Ocean in different ways. Um, and that's what led to the tapestry. Um, sure, it looks easy now. <laughs> <laughs> but it's definitely two years of work that led to one seven foot by seven foot tapestry. Um, and I think, I think I'm sorry. Oh, uh, one thing I would say quickly is I think we've been trained in urban design and architecture to produce drawings that demonstrate labor. And there's always kind of these super dense diagrams and drawings that are supposed to demonstrate how much work was put into it. But when you go into the fine arts, there's kind of a certain reduction and directness, even though the ideas are incredibly layered. And, and I think uh, that was our ambition, you know, with the tapestry, with the first tapestry and this, this one as well. Um, it might not be <laughs> successful, but that's what we were going for. Uh, just a follow up from this same student. Um, and I'm gonna frame it slightly differently. Um, you have the model and then you have the tapestry. Um, how might you describe those as different forms of research or, or thinking? Um, so the, t the task at hand with the exhibition was to look at Atlanta, right? Um, but as I was saying earlier, for, for me as, uh, as someone who migrated to this country, uh, it was important to link Atlanta directly to the continent. So um, as, as I said in the lecture, there was always this interest in looking at the planetary scale and the urban scale simultaneously. So the moment we identified um, the, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, we also clearly identified this diagonal line that currently exists in the city of Atlanta between predominantly white North Atlanta and predominantly black South Atlanta. That line was constructed. It was initially a set of uh, train tracks that now have become combinations of train tracks and highways. So um, in, in one case, it's almost uh, an ontological condition that is represented through uh, geography. <laughs> Um, and on the other, 
and you basically have an urban intervention that that really tries to solidify certain ideas of race. Um, so it was productive for us to go back and forth as we were drawing the city to also be drawing the ocean. Um, and that's what pr uh, produced uh, the two pieces. Um, and the relationships are not always direct, you know, sometimes they, they contradict each other. Well, I think I've exhausted you and um, I really enjoy, um, have enjoyed uh, you know, kind of learning through your work, just as you presented it here, as well as your writing. And I think that the students are, the, the, your next class, our next class in the fall, uh, got a kind of peak in introduction. And so I think uh, that is very useful as, as long as, as well as interesting. Um, but thank you very much for a, a really great lecture and a great series of um, propositions and problems for us to think about. Um, so uh, goodbye everyone and we'll see you next week. Have a good day. Thank you, Emmanuel.